A lot of unprecedented things happened in 2020. A virus turned into a global pandemic. Vaccines were developed in record time. And in the US, we held an election in which more people voted than ever before. We saw voters vote in possibly more ways than they've ever voted before. We saw Americans all over the country raise their voice and go to the ballot box and let their opinion be heard. We saw states and local election officials uh, step up across the country and make accommodations to ensure that they, we could run an election during a global pandemic. It also illuminated many voting problems that we hadn't shed a light on in a long time. And now we see very clearly what the need is for a lot of reforms. But to understand why we need reforms in regards to voting rights, we need to look back at the history of our laws and why they were passed. And we also need to understand what voter suppression looks like today. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was the strongest piece of civil rights legislation ever enacted in the history of our country. It protects all our other rights that we have as Americans, all our civil rights. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was an attempt to address things like poll taxes, things like literacy tests, things that were used by these politicians to disenfranchise voters and eliminate those so that Black voters actually had the right to vote and didn't just have the right to vote on paper. In 1965, when the Voting Rights Act passed, voter suppression looked like hoses and dogs and physical intimidation and uh, literacy tests. Voter intimidation looked like violence, physical violence. Voter suppression today is different in the sense that the goal is ultimately the same. The procedure used to suppress the vote is different. Today, voter suppression looks like voter purges. Voter suppression looks like polling place closures and consolidations, and voter suppression looks like complicated eligibility requirements. They no longer simply say, well, we're going to make it harder for African Americans to register to vote. What they do is they impose mechanisms making it more difficult for people to vote. So how did we get here? If the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was supposed to protect minority communities against voter suppression, why do so many of these communities have difficulty accessing the ballot today? Over the last several decades, the Supreme Court has weakened the Voting Rights Act almost at every turn or interpreted it in a way I think that Congress never intended. Most recently in 2013, the Supreme Court struck down the most effective part of the Voting Rights Act and the coverage formula that then decided which state and local governments had to pre-clear or pre-approve any change that affected voting. And by doing that, the Supreme Court has unleashed numerous voting laws passed by state and local governments that discriminate against minority voters, make them worse off than they were before, and deny them uh, access, equal access to the franchise and participation in government. Okay, it's clear that something needs to change. So what can be done about this going forward? At the federal level, there are two pieces of legislation that would dramatically change access to the right to vote for the better for Americans. And those are uh, colloquially called H.R. 1 and H.R. 4. H.R. 1 is an omnibus bill that's really aimed at modernizing our election system. It expands on essentially every form of voter suppression that we've seen and tries to tackle it piece by piece. So from guaranteeing early voting in federal elections to cleaning up voter registration practices and preventing malicious voter purges. It includes common sense solutions like automatic voter registration, early voting, vote by mail procedures, and makes those uniform across the country so that your access to the ballot doesn't depend on whether or not you live in Alabama or Washington. Thank you. But we also have H.R. 4, renamed the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And that would restore the parts of the Voting Rights Act that were gutted in 2013 in Shelby County v. Holder and create a new preclearance mechanism. Any state that has had repeated violations with respect to voting rights in the last 25 years 
would be subject to that preclearance formula and would have to preclear their voting laws with the Department of Justice. I'm excited to look forward to a, a discussion about voting rights that's not always on the defensive and thinking about how we can press against um, cutbacks and rollbacks on the right to vote. Instead, think about what a 21st American democracy should look like. We can have same day registration, we can have online registration, we can have automatic voter registration. And we can take that kind of modernized approach to all parts of our elections. We can have vote centers so that you can go to the polling location that's closest to your work, even if it's not the polling location for where you live. We can make sure that we have early voting hours that are expansive and that include weekends. These are all things we can imagine and make happen. I became a voting rights attorney so that I could protect all individuals, but especially underserved and underprivileged individuals' right to vote. As a child, I heard stories of my grandfather in Dallas fighting in the 1940s and 1950s to make sure that Black individuals in Dallas could have the right to vote. This spirit has found its way into me as I currently seek to fight for the voting rights of all individuals, not just in Dallas, Texas, but across the country, whose votes are still being challenged and whose voting rights are still being trampled.